teamwork on the fly. Um, and, 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 uh, and indeed, on the fly. So I want to ask you all, look to your right, look to your left. One of you won't be here next year. <laughs> I, hope you un I hope you know the reference. I don't want the uh, internet. No, thank you. Why would it do that? Um, it wants to connect with you. It wants to connect. Very good. So um, <laughs> those words... Those words were infamously spoken by a fictitious law school dean in the paper chase, and likely in many other contexts as well. The message was clear. Your success here at Harvard Law School, according to Hollywood, is absolutely dependent on the failure of others. Right? It's a good message if you think about it. Uh, so what do we do? We look to our left, we look to our right, and we hope desperately that we can beat the other guy. Um, now, although I think it's likely the case that few deans, certainly not mine, and few employers greet their new hires this way anymore, it is still also the case that many of us bring implicit theories about success that are not all that unrelated to those words. We, we get them somewhere in about third or fourth grade, right? My success is at least partially dependent on other people not doing as well as I. And so my, my main premise here is that really, truly, profoundly gets in the way of teamwork. Uh, and I think it's easy to see why. But what if we were to say instead, look to your left, look to your right, how quickly can you discover that other person's unique skills, capabilities, perspective, and so on? Um, not as normal. And that's the very essence of teaming. Teaming is all about uh, lowering our guard and getting curious, as uh, Burke, uh, Burke said. So um, I, I do want to point out the Novartis chair. It's a great chair to have because it is explicitly was funded, was funded, I'm the second occupant, for the study of human interaction that leads to successful enterprises for the betterment of society. I love that. I love that mission. Can't help uh, calling it out. OK, let me ask you all to think of a team right? quickly, very quickly. So something, I hope, popped into your head. And I would suspect that for 80% of you, it's something like this. right? Maybe not this exact team. Uh, this is a very special team, as some of you may know. This is the uh, Harvard basketball team three years ago. Uh, very special, because Jeremy uh, 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 was, uh, was, the, was the captain um, and since became a superstar. But now, uh, the point is, um, we often, when we think about teams, do think about sports teams. They're a great metaphor. Why? Because sports teams are explicitly about doing well by utilizing each other's strengths and weaknesses. If you didn't think of a sports team, you may have thought of something like this, right? The last uh, management team that you coached uh, or, or otherwise. You might have thought of one like this. This is a, a healthcare improvement team, cross-disciplinary, working on uh, finding ways to make the organization better. All of these mental models, if you will, of teams have something in common. It is clear who is a member and who is not. It is clear what their task is. It's, it's uh, usually fairly clear what the resources they are and so on. Those are the very definitions of a team. And in fact, uh, something like 30 or 40 years of team effectiveness research tells us that for teams to be effective, get the structures right. Get the composition right. Get the task right. It has to be interdependent. It has to, they have to have access, yes, to good coaching and good support. All of those things. And yet, what if the profound need for collaboration looks more like this? This is uh, an image from an emergency department context where that patient's very health uh, may depend upon the effective coordination and communication among what we can count as, if you count the white elbow there, uh, at least four distinct caregivers who may not even know each other's names. So this increasingly, in the organizations that I have been studying, I increasingly find that there isn't always time for or ability, because of the nature of the work, 
to set up stable teams that stay together forever, whether it's 24-7 operations, whether it's the fact that not all skills are needed for at all times of a particular project, I see teaming. I see teamwork on the fly, coordinating and collaborating across these boundaries of many kinds, status, knowledge, geography, without the luxury of stable team structures. Teaming, I will argue, is especially needed when the work is complex and unpredictable. And yet, uh, we are not instinctively very good at this. And that's in part because of the look to your left, look to your right phenomenon. Uh, but there's other things we'll go through as well. So I want to just sort of the structure of this talk is based on a recipe for success in a dynamic world. And by, by dynamic, I mean it's in constant flux. Things are always changing. and there's always uncertainty as well, uh, even in reasonably stable contexts. So here's my recipe for success in a dynamic world. Aim high, right? team up, we'll talk a lot about that. Fail well, that sounds like an oxymoron, it's not, and learn fast. Okay, so one by one and in unequal components. Aim high, it starts with aspiration. Nobody ever went through the headaches and the heartaches of teaming without having something they really hoped, deeply aspired to get done. Um, one of my favorite case studies that I've written is on Julie Morath, who was the chief operating officer at Children's Hospital and Clinics in Minneapolis, St. Paul, for a decade. When she came on board in 1999, uh, she made it her mission at the hospital uh, to, to start and lead something called the Patient Safety Initiative. This was aiming high because at that time there was very little discussion and certainly none at this particular organization of the, fa of, of the reality of medication errors, the prevalence, and in fact the possibility that they could be eradicated. It was a worthy aspiration, 100% patient safety. No one will ever be harmed uh, by something we do while they are in our care. Another great example, another case study of aiming high, we will design and build an iconic structure in an extraordinarily short period of time. It will be green, environmentally sustainable. It will be instantly convertible following the Olympics from the aquatic center that will will seat 17,000 spectators to something that will live on in Beijing as a community uh, facility. Uh, and of course, it has to be on time. An incredibly uh, ambitious goal. Uh, we'll come back to that. So aim high, what does it mean? It means fundamentally, I will say, three attributes, worthy. And a worthy goal, a worthy aspiration is one that in some small and sometimes large way passes the, it makes a better world. It makes our lives better. It makes our community better. It touches hearts and minds. I cannot tell you how many executives I have talked to who think 14% ROI is an aspirational goal, right? <laughs> it's not. It's, uh, it's a goal, all right. Uh, and it may even be a stretch, but it doesn't touch your heart. It doesn't have meaning. It's not 100% patient safety or an iconic structure. Uh, and it has to be a stretch. Not impossible, not implausible, not ridiculous, but uh, a stretch. OK, with that goal in mind, you have to team up, step two. You cannot do it alone. Diverse perspectives have to be integrated across boundaries uh, to, uh, to come together through some kind of deliberate and very thoughtful process. So this is the absolute bulk of what I want to talk about. Teaming, how do you do it? Why is it so darn hard? And what can coaches and leaders do about it? First, you have to cross boundaries. Um, and by the way, that does not come naturally to us. You have to seek out diverse perspectives for almost any project of any worth, whether it's patient safety, an iconic building, uh, the rescue of 33 miners, and so on. Um, this does not come naturally to us fallible human beings, right? <laughs> this is funny because it captures a very deep human truth. We are drawn toward people who are like us. We should not scold ourselves for that. It is true, and we must overcome it. So 
Lovely case study, back to the water cube, crossing boundaries of all kinds, a fascinating journey. Four firms, by the way, the, the, uh, the Olympic Committee and the Chinese government put it out there that any major structure at these Olympic Games had to be a collaboration. It had to have the involvement of a Chinese uh, design firm and a Western uh, firms. In this particular proposal that won and that executed, there were four distinct firms involved, including Arup, um, global engineering firm, the uh, uh, Australian part of Arup, Three distinct continents, teeming like mad, this whole, this whole sort of 18-month uh, journey. Dozens, literally dozens of engineering subspecialties. You have no idea how specialized engineering can get. Uh, and um, at the very least, two mother tongues uh, and more. So you're able to cross all those boundaries and, and produce this magnificent structure. I love the image in the middle there, the Chinese designers, just the, the energy of it, the teeming. It captures the nation, no, notion of teeming to me very, very well. And uh, as Tristram Carfrey, who was the, um, not the leader, but in, in many ways the, the conductor of all of this frenzied teeming, says it's impossible in retrospect to attribute any single idea to any single author. It just, it's just not a design with a single author, but rather the work of an empowered collective, and they were all surprised and delighted by it. This is not to say that it was easy, right? Um, this particular project confronted every teeming challenge there is. This is from a Harvard Business Review article last year, um, where I talk about, yes, teeming's here to stay, teeming's necessary, and think about the very real human challenges you confront when you're teeming um, across functional boundaries, you know, working with diverse people is not always easy. We live in different thought worlds. We have different mental models. Uh, working with people across geographic distance, often through communicating through uh, technology. Working with people we don't know very well. Working on a kind of project we've never seen before and facing considerable uncertainty are all Real challenges, and as humans, we would prefer not to have any one of them, thank you very much. The Water Cube Project had them all. So we can think of these as hurdles to overcome for the greater good, and there is a silver lining here. The silver lining is that if you confront these, and if the people you are working with, um, serving, as it were, confront these with enthusiasm, in fact, there's a very real opportunity to, as I th like to think about it, go to school, right? If you're confronting and dealing with these barriers, in fact, uh, there are benefits to the individuals, not just to the organization. Working with people with different disciplines, you have an opportunity to learn about uh, different uh, disciplines. You get a broader perspective. You get insight into different cultures. You, broad you develop a beautiful uh, global network, uh, and so on and so forth, you really do get to go to school. This is how, I will argue, talent is developed in the new world, the new organization. It's not all in the classroom, it's in the project. So, so teaming up, we cross boundaries to ensure diversity and make it safe. Make it safe. What do I mean by make it safe? This is actually where for the past uh, 20 years or so, uh, most of my research has been focused on this one psychological issue. What do I mean? Let me tell you um, just briefly about the study that started this all. Um, two decades ago, I was fortunate to be a part of a, a larger team looking at adverse uh, drug events in um, a couple of our, our local teaching hospitals here, which shall remain nameless um, uh, for the purpose of this talk. And, and I ask you, and I ask many audiences really around the world, which look at these data, look at them carefully. What we see on the right are um, preventable, so I've taken out all those that were unpreventable and left in the data set only the preventable um, errors related to medication and uh, they are expressed in terms of 1,000 patient days. So I ask people, and it's actually not very easy to get uh, the, the uh, a wrong answer anymore nowadays, but I ask people which unit is the safest. The obvious answer is, of course, Memorial 3. It looks like they don't make errors down there in Memorial 3. Um, that's clearly not the right answer as we now know, but at the time it fooled even, even our team. 
Um, we now know that we learn, when we start looking at errors in organizations, what the climate lets us learn. What do I mean? The units here, by the way, if you go back and you wondered what was Amy's sorting rule, right? Because at first glance, it sure looks like biggest to smallest. And then you look carefully in the middle and you sort of realize, wait a minute, if Amy didn't go to MIT, or uh, there's something else going on here, right? I couldn't even sort a simple list of numbers. Well, I'll tell you how they're sorted now. They're sorted by observer ratings of reporting climate, of openness. My goodness. I don't think I did it. Hello? Hello, Mike? Uh, I can, oh, it's back. Wonderful. So um, sorted by observer ratings of unit openness, and I don't think you have to be a PhD statistician to eyeball that correlation. It is, in fact, a Spearman rank order correlation of 0.98. So what do we learn? We learn that climate, we learn two things. One, we learn that people speak up when the climate allows them to speak up. And second, we learn that climate varies significantly, even within large organizations, right? The differences between units in Memorial are greater than the differences between Memorial and, and University. So what do I mean by reporting climate? Well, here are some quotes uh, from a, an ethnographer involved in the study from the bottom of that chart. We hear things like, Mistakes are, uh, are, you treat you as guilty, she meaning the boss, in this case the nurse manager, treats you as guilty, you don't want to have made one, you get the silent treatment, you get put on trial, very evocative language here, and very understandable, given what's at stake. What were perhaps more surprising was what we saw near the top of that chart, where the numbers were large. We saw nurse managers who said things like, nurses are too hard on themselves, right? Why would I come down hard on a nurse who feels terrible already? We need to, we need to get to the bottom of it, absolutely. We need to learn, we need to make it better. Uh, but the last thing you would want to do is put someone on trial. They're harder on themselves than I would ever be. And my favorite quote in the study, because it reveals such a lovely implicit theory, one nurse in oncology, by the way, said, well, the mistakes in this unit are serious because of the toxicity of the drugs that we use. So of course you're never afraid uh, to speak up. <laughs> Say what? So think of that, because that's what I call an implicit theory. It's an if-then statement. And what she's saying is, if toxic, then it's easy to speak up. I guarantee you they did not have that same theory across the hall. Right? So somebody, somebody made it that way. Um, I began to be quite fascinated with that. I began to formalize what the kind of climate we see at the top as a climate of psychological safety, the kind of climate we see at the bottom as one very much lacking in psychological safety. But if you think this just applies to healthcare, uh, it is not so. Um, I think that all leaders and certainly all coaches as well, must be aware of this phenomenon, the phenomenon um, described on this slide, which is the fact that nobody, and I don't care how passionate you are about your job, wakes up in the morning really eager to go to work today to look ignorant, incompetent, intrusive, or negative. Right? Am I right? That just doesn't sound like fun. And fortunately, we've each learned strategies at an early age for, for dealing with that. Right? Maybe, again, late grade school. We figure out uh, that if I don't want to look stupid, I don't ask questions. If I don't want to look incompetent, I don't admit mistakes, and so on and so forth. Um, this is a strategy for self-protection. Um, it is not a strategy, of course, for organizational learning or even for helping patients be safe. So uh, the, the, the good news, or maybe the bad news, depending, is that Interpersonal risk is absolutely natural. It's part of evolution's gift to us. We feel anxious in hierarchies about what higher-ups think of us. Um, and so it can be exacerbated, made absolutely worse, or it can be ameliorated by the behavior of leaders. And to, and to clarify that statement, let me go to one of my favorite scholarly journals uh, to make it clear. Uh, that would be The New Yorker. <clears throat> and 
this says for those of you in the back excellent that's four good guys for it presumably my good idea and two bad guys against it uh, now unlike some of the other case studies I'll mention today I don't know much about this case study but I think we all know two things for sure right the speaker is the boss, and the bad guys won't be speaking up again anytime soon. Uh, we, it, it's also possibly the case that they're all men, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, so, <laughs> so, I mean, in real life, bosses rarely say bad guys. Some of them do. I've been reading the Jobs book, but uh, your face shows it, right? You, you, you do give it away. We got we to do better. We got to do a lot better than that. And that's what I call psychological safety. Psychological safety describes a climate where people believe it's safe to bring their full selves to work. They won't be punished, humiliated, made to feel less good about themselves, called a bad guy for being themselves, for ideas, for questions, for concerns, work-relevant uh, concerns, uh, that is. More real data, more, more uh, uh, not a cartoon, are data that I collected with Ingrid Nemhard as a doctoral student, now a faculty member at Yale. Uh, this was a study of 26 ICUs in 26 hospitals, and we uh, surveyed 1,100 clinicians in these three categories, physician, nurse, respiratory therapist, in that particular setting. And I'm sorry to say, as predicted, there was a statistically significant uh, sort of psychological safety boost with medical status. Um, <clears throat> so I said we predicted this. Uh, this is um, a kind of well understood phenomenon about status hierarchies that people at the top feel uh, a more automatic right to bring their ideas uh, to play, their observations. However, this isn't the end of the story because when Ingrid and I looked more carefully at the data, we discovered that this shape was not common across all hospitals. In fact, some of them were flat, uh, absolutely flat, which of course meant flat and high, if you think about it. And that meant that others were far steeper than what we see here. So what was the difference? What explained those units where there wasn't the status-based psychological safety uh, gap? Um, and we called that difference, having looked into it, uh, inclusive leadership. Inclusive leadership is not rocket science by any stretch of the imagination. It's leaders who are actually like, more like coaches, more accessible. They proactively ask others what they're thinking. A little bit of inquiry, as we shall discover, goes a very long way. They acknowledge their own fallibility. They don't roll over and play dead, but they do say things like, I might miss something I need to hear from you. Statement of fact, if you think about it. Right? The beauty of, of the inclusive leader is that he or she, in fact, lowers the very real psychological costs of voice, of speaking up. We all intuitively know that that's costly. They also, more subtly, raise the psychological cost of silence. No one ever got fired for not speaking up at work. Right? But if I ask you a direct question and I'm the boss, you would feel very silly remaining silent. So you will respond. The cost just went up of silence. Um, so speaking up, uh, psychological safety, we see this even in our own, our local uh, friends here, the Brigham, more willingness after all these years uh, to air mistakes, to report errors, and so on and so forth. And so at least some of you must be worrying, right? At least the executives I. I uh, teach down up, up river a little bit, uh, do worry. They listen, they say, I understand this. I think I realize that psychological safety would help people team and learn and help the organization learn, but do I have to sacrifice accountability? By which they mean holding people accountable for excellence, right? And I say, I can understand why you might think about it that way, and I think it's the wrong mental model, that trade-off, that balance beam. That's not what it is. In fact, I think as leaders, you have an obligation to manage both of these dimensions at the same time. They both matter. Psychological safety, what I've been talking about, and performance management, clarity about what's expected, 
clarity, provision of feedback, uh, letting you know how you're doing, and so on. If you don't do a good job, I say, or uh, managing either one, then alas, you've got people in the apathy zone, um, a tragic state of affairs, and one I see rarely uh, anymore. If, of course, as you worry, you do a great job managing psychological safety, uh, but not such a good job on performance management, then yes, then you've got people in the comfort zone. I can't tell you how anxious this makes them. Uh, if, conversely, you do a really good job uh, communicating standards around here, but not so much on psychological safety, then people are in the anxiety zone. This, alas, was the state of too many of those units we studied in the, med in the medical error study, right? The, the clinicians, physicians, nurses, and others who felt uh, desperately uh, the desire to do a good job and understood what the standards were, but felt they could not speak up um, about that which goes wrong. <clears throat> of course, if you do a good job of both, I call that the learning zone. It's also the high performance zone under the following conditions, either enormous uncertainty or interdependence, or both. Right? If you don't have uncertainty and you don't have interdependence, then you can probably get away with the anxiety zone and not see a performance decrement. Uh, but if either of those two conditions are present, uh, then the learning zone and the high, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, high performance zone are one and the same. And so, uh, there are reams to be filled, and you in this room have filled most of them already on how do you, what do you need to do uh, to manage accountability. I'll leave that to you. We can come back and talk about it if you wish uh, at the end. Uh, but let me, uh, let me quickly uh, move on uh, to the, the third thing I want to say about effective teaming after crossing boundaries and making it psychologically safe. We have to remind ourselves, just as, as the uh, uh, prior speaker did, be curious, right? This is the look to your left, look to your right. How quickly can I find out what that other person knows, right? So why is it so essential for, for you as coaches and for managers everywhere to cultivate curiosity? And it's because of this simple psychological truth, right? I, as an individual, any individual, suffer from certain patterns of awareness, just simply the way it is. I am aware of my intentions, and by the way, they're very good, right? <laughs> I am aware of your actions and the impact they have on me, right? Of course. Uh, however, and tragically sometimes, I am unaware of my actions, really, truly, I, th I don't realize that, but I am unaware in a very profound way of the impact I have on you. And I am, of course, because it's not tattooed on your forehead even though you think it is, I am unaware of your intentions. Similarly, I'm unaware of the situation as you see it. What are you up against? And you're unaware of what I'm up against. So this, the, this kind of uh, um, basic uh, blind spot means we cannot team effectively unless we close those blind spots, open them up, you know, may, find, fill them in, understand. I cannot get anywhere with you until I understand your intentions, what you're up against, and, and vice versa. So this is what it's all about. How do you build effective relationships, and particularly, how do you do it on the fly? I'm gonna argue it's pretty simple, right? Seek first to understand, right? It's so tempting, in fact, so human, to explain first and ask later. But I'm gonna suggest that seeking first to understand is the way to go, and you, there's not that much you have to understand, as we just saw. I have to understand um, your, what, what you're trying to do, what you bring, and what you're up against. And then I also need to convey that uh, on my part, right? So effective teaming requires this balance of asking and telling. Often, I'm gonna argue leading with asking. And this comes from wonderful work by the pioneering scholar in organizational learning, Chris, Chris Ardris, who's now in his 90s. And uh, this, this idea, he uses these more academic words, advocacy and inquiry. And I know most of you have probably heard about this model. But if I don't, if I am in a, 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 the positive version of a situation where I'm low on both is really what you're 
all doing right now. You're observing. You're in a position where your role is to observe, and that makes sense, right? If I, as I'm up here doing right now, am doing mostly talking and very little asking, well, that's okay, provided I'm invited to be in a position of explaining or teaching. Um, sometimes, as a researcher, as a coach, you're really working on interviewing, uh, and yet teaming must occur up here. Right? Mutual learning cannot happen without this balance. And you might think, why do we even have to say this? Well, it's because literally thousands and thousands of transcripts of management team conversations reveal the true inquiry is a rare beast. Right? And I'm going to give you one uh, very remarkable, very well-known, and very tragic illustration uh, here. You all, some of you, some of you in this room are old enough to know exactly where you were uh, when you heard this news. <clears throat> I certainly am. And, uh, and what I want to um, remind you of then is in 1986 when we, uh, the, the shuttle program uh, decided to show the world how, how very safe and routine its activities were by putting a New Hampshire teacher um, in the crew. And the, the day before the launch, it was revealed that there were to be unusually cold temperatures, temperatures in the 20s Fahrenheit in Florida the next morning. There were a couple of engineers at Morton Thiokol, the contractor to NASA, who developed what's called the O-rings that were deeply concerned about how O-rings might perform in very cold temperatures. Now, meanwhile, NASA uh, is, has been mocked by Dan Rather and others for delays, and they're very anti-delay, as you can imagine. But because of the concerns, a phone conference was called for 11 p.m. the night before the launch. Um, the engineers, especially Roger Boisjolais, later became really famous for this, faxed over some data to try to convey to NASA their concerns. And this is what they faxed. And what you see here, just very simply, horizontal axis is temperature in Fahrenheit. Vertical axis is the number of incidents, which means the number of small failures. Uh, Roger, uh, Roger was, was, was absolutely fixated on these failures. So he was looking and looking and looking. And in his gut, he knew there was a relationship uh, to cold. Again, those of you who are uh, statisticians can readily eyeball this and say there is no damn relationship, right? It's a cloud at best. Maybe even looks like it's going the other way. So um, these are not great, great data to start with. But what I want to show you is just exactly two minutes of the actual conversation um, on, in, in a transcript uh, form. By the way, um, you, get on that, you get on that chart. You know, Roger put you on that chart if you had a problem, right? Think, think about that. We'll come back to that. OK, so here's, here is the conversation. And it, it's, uh, it starts with, actually, um, one of the senior managers at, at uh, Morton Thiokol asking, he said, our engineers will give you a presentation. Arnie Thompson starts, the, he's one of the two engineers, he starts the presentation as follows. We have no data. Lovely start, by the way. Right? If you want to compel audiences, uh, we have no data on O-rings operating at temperatures this low, et cetera. Uh, we fact this through. If you have trouble reading them, let us know. Very casual, very casual. Roger then says, hey, I want to call your attention to Flight 15, launched a year ago. It was 53 degrees, and look at all those problems. Remember those, right? 53, that's this guy. Yeah, it had a lot of problems. Um, and then, um, okay, yeah, go ahead. We got the charts. Uh, okay, now, Roger. So, want to make sure you all know, Air Force estimates 29 degrees tomorrow morning. This is far below our experience base, et cetera, et cetera. There could be danger. Bob Lund, senior guy again. So our recommendation is, you should see it coming through right now, don't launch until the temperature's at least 53 degrees, which, by the way, was our prior low uh, for, the whole, for the whole program. Now. On the very next slide, we're going to see NASA's response, Larry Malloy. We're going to see his response. And you've seen the data, and you've heard the presentation. He says, whoa, wait a minute. Am I looking at the right charts? The charts I have don't support that conclusion. OK, so that's, that's surprise. By the way, what do you do with surprise? You inquire into it. 
But no, that's the press. Roger responds, they do. I think they do. Okay, we're in a tennis match now. Yeah, I've listened to everything you said, and uh, I just don't see how you got that recommendation. It's not logical. It's perfectly logical. Have you ever heard a conversation like this <laughs> in an organization, right? They happen all the time, right? There's a lot at stake here, more than in the usual conversation, but these conversations happen all the time. Larry responds, and why does he respond this way? Think about this. Well, you began by saying that what you're, what you're presenting couldn't be proved, and I agree, right? It can't. I agree with you on that. It can't be proved. But you're drawing serious recommendations. Roger, serious recommendations are called for. Well, of course, exasperated. That's why we're here, by the way, at 11 p.m. on the, you know, when we could all be in bed getting ready. Uh, and it sounds like you're trying to da 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 And then he says, my God, Thiokol, when do you want me to launch? Next April? Right. Now, what kind of rhetorical move is that? Right. It's, it's clearly, it's a rhetorical question, of course. I mean, we're talking about a day or two, not four months. But why does he put it that way? He's upset. He's angry. For, from his point of view, delay is bad, and delay without data makes no sense. Like, help me out here. Does he create the conditions whereby Roger can put forward a good argument? No. Does Roger create the, commissions, the, the conditions whereby uh, the two of them, or the eight of them, or the ten of them can put their heads together and get this thing right? No. This frame needed to be switched from a tennis match or a debate or a who wins or a who is smarter. It goes on, by the way. It goes on for a while where um, right, right at one point uh, Malloy says, it's not what I learned in engineering school, right? This is a clearly like who's is, you know, who's smarter. Who's smarter, right? <laughs> so um, the point is, you know, and, and, and if there's any inquiry in this whole transcript, it's only rhetorical. It's not genuine. So the point is that not all advocacy and inquiry are created equal. There's advocacy that promotes learning. There's inquiry that promotes learning. It promotes learning when you really explain, why am I thinking that way? It, it promotes learning when you really ask genuinely, help me understand. And you mean it, right? It's not one of those rhetorical devices. It limits learning when you do the opposite. You don't explain. You see confirming views. And this is what this conversation did, and this is what uh, most conversations like this did. Could it have been better? I would argue absolutely. Maybe we needed a coach. But with curiosity, with curiosity, any one of the people in that call, in that meeting, could have said, wait a minute. What do we know about the successful flights? By the way, at this point in the shuttle program, these dots were like people's children. They could recite them by heart. You know, they could say things like STS-51C, 53 degrees, three incidents, right? They could do that because they knew this well. As soon as we fill in the gaps here, the ni all 19 flights to date, the regression line is obvious, right? It pops right out. What was in Roger's gut becomes accessible to the whole room. They could have done that with inquiry. They could have done that with a modicum of reframing this from a, a debate, a contest who wins, to a problem-solving episode among a bunch of geeky engineers who like to problem-solve. Didn't happen. Um, so didn't happen because they had their disagreement at the, at the top of the ladder of inference. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the concept of the ladder of inference? Not everybody. Wonderful, then I get to tell you about it. Chris Argerus's concept. And the idea is simply that our minds, right, our beautiful human minds, leap to the top of a ladder of inference effortlessly. What does that mean? It means we go from data, and data doesn't mean formal scientific data, but facts, experiences, even the emotions on people's faces and so forth, we quickly jump. First, we select that data to pay attention to. And we quickly jump to inferences, reasoning, and ever so quickly, we arrive at our own opinion or conclusion, right? <clears throat> the, the, that's not bad. In fact, if we didn't have that built into our cognition, we probably couldn't function. What's bad is that our conclusions seem to us, they take on for us the moral imperative of fact. Right? They seem right and obviously right. Our conversations happen 
as we saw just now, at the level of conclusions. Let me show you another example to show how this really works. This was uh, another case study I wrote on, I, I will not name this particular uh, former baby bell, uh, but this was um, their 1999 decision to launch digital subscriber line technology full scale in a major metropolitan uh, market that is south of here. <clears throat> and in that, we had a debate that we observed where the operations executives said, quite simply, we can't pull it off. The marketing executive said, it was kind of almost at the same time, let's roll it out, this thing is great. Now, <laughs> why do they disagree? Right? And this is why. The marketing executive selects from the vast, without meaning to, but it's because of his expertise, from the vast pool of available data. He looks at financial projections, customer desire. Wow, customers can't wait to have high-speed internet, get off, dial up, and so on. Um, we, we, we need this business. This is the future. This is great. Let's do it. Let's go for it. Meanwhile, our friend over in operations is taking a close look at our staff, their technological skills, our infrastructure, and saying, there's no way. Right? If we try to do this, we will fail and fail badly. Unfortunately, the marketing executive has the ear of the CEO, um, and the marketing executive talks money that always wins over operations. Uh, they do it. They roll out. It's the biggest failure in the company's history. Um, why did it happen? Well, it happened because the, the conversation happens at the top of the ladder of inference. Um, how do you do better? Well, you got to bridge that impasse in some way other than letting the most powerful person decide or the loudest person decide. And that is a process of walking carefully and slowly back down the ladder of inference. Um, and it requires this blend of advocacy. This is how I see it. This is how I got here. And this is uh, what I need to understand about how you got there. Uh, and on and on it goes. So the skills for teaming across diverse boundaries, status, distance, knowledge-based, are to walk slowly down the ladder of inference, invite others to help you see what you might be missing, actively seek others' views, and inquire into, as Larry Malloy did not, surprises. Surprises should let us know there's something going on here. Let's take a look. Um, so team up, cross boundaries, make it safe, be curious, but still, right? But still, things will go wrong. So my third element of a recipe for success in a dynamic world is fail well. <laughs> I know, I know, it sounds wrong. It sounds like an oxymoron, but in organizations that learn, people have to be comfortable speaking up, not knowing, not being right, and yes, even failing. To which at least the executives I meet at Harvard Business School respond, nice idea, <laughs> right? But in the real world, by which they mean not the academic world that you live in, uh, it doesn't work that way. And then they ask this nice rhetorical question, isn't success better than failure? To which I respond almost instinctively, well, yes, but slow down, actually, no. This is where you can tell I'm an academic. You see, it depends. Well, what does it depend on? It actually depends on what does success mean. And I want to just remind you that success means profoundly different things in different contexts. If you are, and maybe I should say lucky enough, to be in a routine production environment, then success is truly all about efficiency, cost, right? Get it right every time and do it faster than the competition, and that's where, that's how you make money. And if you are in a complex service operation, and by complex I mean the the patients differ, the situations differ, it's sort of never, you're never standing in the same river twice, then success is fundamentally about doing it right, doing it safely, every time, best you can, right? If you're in R&D, well then, great, success is clear. It's innovation. It's something new to the world that is also useful, right? desirable. Now, if you are in the basic science, just to complete the spectrum here, uh, then success is all about what? Discovery, absolutely. So discovery, the great thing about discovery is it, it doesn't have to work or be useful. It just has to be true, right? 
What's the point? The point is <laughs> uncertainty goes up, up, up. And that means that the failure rates will necessarily go up, up, up. Now, if that's simply a fact, it also must be the case that, that leaders must respond to failures different and that a failure is not a failure is not a failure. So in, in um, a recent uh, HBR article on, on this topic I, and in the book as well, I talk about there are really are three types of failures. And it's almost, it's a shame we have the same word for all of them. But the first are preventable failures, right? And that's where we do know collectively we got the knowledge, we can do it right, let's do it right. The second kind are the complex failures, where a bunch of circumstances combine in novel ways. James Reason, the great error theorist, calls this the Swiss cheese uh, model, uh, to produce failures in, in essentially familiar contexts. And the third kind are, yes, intelligent failures. Right? Really, truly, I mean it, intelligent failures. These are Undesired results, we still didn't want it to go this way, but undesired results of thoughtful forays into, into novel territory. I'll just quickly illustrate each of these in the uh, Toyota, uh, the very early days of Toyota's mass production in the US in Georgetown, Kentucky. They had some small um, rips on the seat fabrics. That is a preventable error, let me assure you. They figured it out. At Children's Hospital where, where Julie Morath uh, was the chief operating officer. Um, there was a, 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 a terrible incident, fortunately responded too quickly in time to, uh, to save the patient, but the patient, a 10-year-old boy, received a, a wildly unsafe dose of morphine because about eight small process things were out of whack, lined up, Swiss cheese, right? complex failure. And the third, Eli Lilly, the, the great pharma uh, giant, um, had a, a, a drug, Alimta, uh, that, that failed its clinical trials despite high hopes and great data in advance. Um, disappointing, but yes, an intelligent failure. So fail well means avoid preventable failures. You can only do that through early detection and correction. Anticipate and mitigate complex failures. Vigilance could uh, speak reams about this, uh, but we won't today. Um, and speed up, have more intelligent failures. Have them sooner, have them, have them faster, and then learn fast, right? Learn fast um, with focus and discipline. You will fail, so fail well and learn fast. Um, what does that look like? Well, it's systematic, you know this. You diagnose, you act, you reflect. Uh, the US Army has a wonderful model for how do you reflect effectively, the after action review, what did we set out to do? What happened? What's the gap? What do we do differently? Can't be any simpler than that. And you have to have that, that process discipline, I would argue, to learn effectively in the collective. So learn fast, diagnose, design, act, reflect, but it has to be tailored to the context we just talked about. Is it routine? Is it complex? Is it innovation? It's a different learning strategy for each. So for routine operations, it's, it's good old lean TQM, identify problems, get the root causes, devise small improvements. We don't reinvent the wheel. We make it better and better. And we have to make sure it's psychologically safe to speak up. In complex operations, we have to really make sure it's safe to speak up about everything. And when things do slip and go wrong, we need to get everyone together from every single perspective that touched the event and deeply dig into what happened. Not who did it, but what happened. And then last but not least, in the innovation context, the job is to fail faster, to learn faster. Share results quickly, identify the lessons, team up to design new potential failures, and make sure it's safe to experiment not to just do safe things. Now back to Lily for just a second, because this was um, one of those rare but happy events whereby by digging into and trying to reflect on the intelligent failure, they discovered something interesting. That in fact, those patients who did not do well uh, simply suffered a folic acid deficiency, a vitamin B as it were. So, by, by giving patients the folic acid at the same time as the 
drug, uh, they were able to convert a failure into a success. That doesn't always happen, but it certainly cannot happen unless we uh, explicitly do the careful formal reflection that needs doing. And so this is really all about crucial aspect in today's complex dynamic organizations. We have to reframe failure. It goes back to the paper chase, right? We learned this frame. I call it the traditional frame. We learned it sometime in late grade school, right? Failure is not acceptable. The, the, the good, smart kids don't fail ever. And uh, you, know, you want to prevent failures at all costs. Whereas in today's world, I think this, this one works very well, in fact, this frame, to help people hide failures, uh, which isn't so good. Uh, but uh, this reframe is, yep, failure is a natural byproduct of experimentation. Effective performers learn from intelligent failures. And uh, the, the manager or coach's job is to promote learning. This promotes learning and innovation. So recipe for success in a dynamic world, aim high, team up, fail well, learn fast, and repeat. Right? It never stops. It keeps going. There are always more aspirations uh, to achieve and more learning to do. Um, what I thought I would do here, um, we have a couple of minutes left to see if there are any questions. And then um, I have some parting thoughts that will take a couple of minutes. So just uh, any questions? Yes. Absolutely, I can. Um, now that they are ready, uh, I can definitely, I can definitely share them. Yeah, yeah. And everything I've said is better said in the book, so get the book. But uh, and, and there it is, right? There it is, right on the cover. Uh, so um, yeah. So and, yes. Can, can, can you use the mic so everyone can hear? Okay, I'm a physician and I'm an intensivist. And I think one of the problems I face is that people that make decisions don't have uh, what uh, Nicholas Taleb calls uh, skin in the game. Skin in the game, yeah. Um, huh. We're, uh, you know, I'm in the front line and I encounter those things. Between me and the decision makers, there's so many layers, ah, and they yeah, don't. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> it's a very important point. So actually, it's you know every every uh, program we do, every group we work with, they say, yeah, but they won't let they won't let us at some at some level. And I say, well, you're they, and generally you're they to way more people. You know, we naturally look up, like right? we look up to those layers that seem to be in our way. Um, all you can do is control your own behavior, right? All you can do is start somewhere. Related to skin in the game, this to me is where the aim high part comes from. Like we could, we could have this whole approach without the aim high and I think we, it wouldn't work. It's like skin in the game means at some level I have connected deeply with what it is we're trying, we're trying to do. It's part, it becomes part of my identity to want to make this happen. So it's going to, I'm then, I'm then more willing to engage in the suffering, and it is suffering. Inquiry is suffering. Risk taking is suffering. We're going to, but we're not going to do it unless we have some motivation. Skin in the game, some motivation. I think generally, uh, the more powerful motivations are not related to economic and others, but to some uh, inner soul. Uh, sort of connection with, with, with the work we do. Um, but you have to start somewhere, right? People have to be willing uh, to, start, to start somewhere. And so in, um, in a sense, actually with my eye on the clock here, let me just finish up with just a few, four in fact, leadership behaviors that I think are absolutely powerful in creating an environment of psychological safety and enabling us to look to our right and left to quickly get up to speed with what each other knows. And the first and foremost leadership behavior is frame the work. And this goes back to my spectrum, right? Are we in a routine, well understood context? Are we in a complex, variable, uncertain setting? Or are we on the bleeding edge of research and discovery, right? Now, you might think, well, wait a minute, 
Don't the people I'm working with know what work they do? Don't they know that they're in a, in a factory or in a lab? Of course they do. But they don't necessarily know the meaning that the, that the leader makes of it or the meaning that you make of it. This is fundamentally a meaning-making job, reminding people what's at stake, what we're doing, and why, especially as we move to the right, why it's really OK, in fact, essential for us to fail. David Kelly, the great founder uh, and now chairman of IDEO, um, most successful product design consultancy of all time, has this motto, this leadership framing statement. Fail often, and he says it all the time, and here's a crazy team in his, in his company doing just that. Fail often, he says, to succeed sooner. Great framing statement by a leader, but note it would not be a great statement for the automotive assembly line, right? <laughs> So context matters, and they can't read your mind. Second, acknowledge your own limits. That's, this is what our medical directors did in the ICUs with the flat psychological safety curve. Here's the deal. You know you're fallible. Right? They know you're fallible. They just don't know that you know. So let them in on the secret. <laughs> right? Third thing, embrace messengers. What do we usually do with messengers? Shoot them, right? So there's a saying, you know it, don't shoot the messenger. I think that's a pretty low bar, right? Right? <laughs> think about it. Messenger gets to keep his life. Um, no, we got to do better. We got to hug them, right? Literally or metaphorically, really acknowledge and celebrate people who come to you with bad news. Um, back to Lily for a second. The chief scientific officer instituted failure parties, right? Failure parties. Now, you might think that's a bridge too far, um, but when, the drug, uh, when a drug fails, um, we actually have a party. Maybe it's not champagne. Maybe it's just beer, but we have that party. Why? Three things. One, it continues to communicate that failure is, in fact, a part of success in innovation. Two, people come, right? <laughs> And if they come, they hear about it. And if they hear about it, they don't go out and reproduce it. And three, it encourages, in a very small and subtle way, it encourages the messengers to come forward earlier, not later. And coming forward earlier means all of those wonderful, valuable resources are now redeployed on the next potential failure or success. And last but not least, encourage dissent. My friends over at HBR say that this is a good way to find out where the traders are. <clears throat> Actually, not what I had in mind. This is what I had in mind. This is one of the great quotes from business history, and you know it's history. Why? Gentlemen, Gentlemen exactly. We don't say that anymore. Um, <laughs> and it's not because their behavior isn't any good. So, Gentlemen, he says, and this is Alfred P. Sloan, the great general manager who led General Motors uh, through decades of success. Um, History, again. Uh, so, gentlemen, he says, and they're talking about a very key business decision. I take it we're in complete agreement about this decision. Sounds like pretty good news. Then he says, I postpone, I propose we postpone further discussion of this issue to give ourselves time to develop disagreement, which interestingly he equates with deeper, fuller understanding. Interesting, right? So everywhere I go, managers tell me, oh, yeah, I, 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 I encourage dissent. Almost never do they hear agreement as a red flag, as a danger sign. Right? So this is back to advocacy and inquiry. If everybody's agreeing, and it's, an, it's not about what are we going to have for lunch today, if everyone's agreeing, it's a risk factor. Stop, challenge, choose, encourage dissent. So, uh, Thank you very much. It's been uh, great spending this time with you. <clears throat>